Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me today for a few minutes while we talk a little bit about investment bubbles present and past, trying to answer the question of are we in uh, an investment bubble of any kind right now? So my name is Tom Connolly. I'm President and Chief Investment Officer of Versant Capital Management, Inc., and we're going to go on this topic today for 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then uh, uh, I might actually go over a little bit on this topic today because it's so much fun. I, um, there's a lot of intersection of uh, current market events, history, psychology in this topic um, that make it a lot, of, a lot of fun to deal with because it's so rich and textured in, in so many different ways. <clears throat> so the reason, uh, one of the reasons bubbles come up so often is they're typically very rapid uh, movements, in, positive movements at first in, in prices of investments or securities. And uh, it typically generates a lot of uh, uh, talk around when people, you go to the country club or the uh, whatever social gathering you're at and you hear stories about how your neighbors are getting rich. Um, quickly and somewhat effortlessly by being smart enough or fortunate enough to, to have been investing in something that is uh, in the process of going vertical in terms of uh, price appreciation. And so nothing motivates, very few things motivate human beings as much as uh, jealousy. So at the root of um, the idea between an investment behind an investment bubble when prices are moving so rapidly in one direction. Uh, I think you have to understand the difference between uh, speculation and investment. Uh, so speculation in general is the, the idea of forming a theory or conjecture without firm evidence or data. And so we're just kind of talking out our pockets about a, a subject which we may know a lot or a little um, and speculating uh, theory or something to explain a particular event. Um, now, in the context of uh, um, investing, uh, Lord Keynes in the 30s actually had a, a definition which uh, said appropriate for the term speculation is the activity of forecasting the psychology of the market. Another more modern way to put it, um, you know, speculation is like an epidemic. Uh, some, an investment gets popular, like Bitcoin today, draws more people, more stories or narratives build around it, the price goes up, and there's this reinforcing cycle. Um, uh, and the idea is that I'm going to invest in something that I hope someone is willing to pay more for in the future. And, and therein is the rub. In speculation, that link between underlying investment value and the price in the future becomes further and further detached from reality, if it was ever present in the first place. Uh, Keynes uh, talked about uh, investment, investing in, in, uh, as uh, contrasted to speculation in terms of enterprise, um, and it's basically forecasting the perspective yield uh, prospective yield of investments over the lifetime of the uh, investment. So imagine you have a piece of rental real estate and you're trying to figure out what it's worth. Well, you may try to forecast the um, rents you're getting now after uh, paying all expenses and knowing that over the future as there's inflation or as people's wages increase, you expect to get an increase in your income uh, and you can actually value that stream over time and then come up with a valuation. And so you're linking, you're linked to underlying fundamentals. You know, I'm gonna rent my money out, um, buy this piece of real estate instead of spend the money, I'm gonna buy this piece of real estate and I expect some compensation uh, for that. In speculation, that becomes uh, secondary and you're more uh, concerned about the narrative the story driving the price in the future. Um, and so some things can get disconnected from reality. And so bubbles are uh, most of the time by spec by definition, a form of speculation rather than investment. So if you're uh, working with uh, someone advising you on your investments and they are saying, well, I'm a, I'm a fiduciary. Uh, in other words, I put uh, your interests before mine. 
uh, the client's interest before mine, uh, speculation should not really be a part of their advice because it does not um, inure, uh, does not relate to the basic underlying returns on, uh, uh, on investments. It relies on something more uh, as a definition of speculation, a theory without uh, conjecture, without evidence or data. Uh, that is not a fiduciary uh, activity. So what is a bubble? Well, um, uh, Robert Schiller, Nobel laureate in 13, defined a bubble as a, so a social epidemic that involves ex extravagant expectations for the future. Um, and he couches it in terms of uh, uh, events that, that start happening, increase markets, and feed on themselves over time until they don't. It's kind of like a game of musical chairs, uh, if you played that when you were young. Um, where uh, the, when the music stops, they take, uh, or before the music stops, they take a chair away. And so there's always one person without a chair. Well, a bubble, an investment bubble, prices go up and can go up parabolically, very, almost vertical, very quickly. But when the music stops and the prices go down on the other side, it, it's more like not taking out one chair, but maybe they take out eight out of 10 chairs. And so only two people are left. Everyone else loses money. And um, excuse me for a minute. So, uh, what does a, a bubble typically involve? What are the ingredients of these fast vertical price movements and subsequent declines? Well, they almost always involve a, a master narrative, a story. And today you hear the word disruption, markets being disrupted a lot. And actually, that's not a new thing at all. I mean, we go back um, into the early 1800s. Can you think of something more disruptive to uh, an economy in a positive way than uh, ocean-going vessels moving from sail to power? Or on the Mississippi River, the powered um, uh, movement up and down the river uh, enables you to traverse the river on both sides and not having, uh, having to rely on current or pull, uh, uh, pulling barges back up river to do the downstream uh, trip, uh, or ocean going vessels, power versus sail, or transmitting um, messages over distance going from the Pony Express where it might take days, even weeks to take a message from one locale to another to the telegraph where all of a sudden we could communicate instantaneously. In the There are disruptive narratives in the past um, and around them are investment manias, very similar to what we've seen in the tech bubble, the go-go years or the 20s. Uh, it's nothing new. So today we talk about technologies disrupting other markets. Well, that's not an unusual thing uh, in, the, in, the, in U.S. history over time. The other thing is a, a, a huge potential market. Today it's taught that term is total addressable market, uh, which in some uh, cases means every consumer on the planet, depending on what the service or idea is. You know, electric vehicles is a good example. Many, um, you know, everybody who drives a car is part of that total addressable market. Uh, back in the internet days, it was potential in the uh, late 1900s, is potential clicks or uh, uh, people on the internet. In any case, um, there's always a, a huge potential market. In the 20s, it was radio. Uh, everybody will own, someday own a radio everywhere on earth. Um, the other, the next point is a delusion that all investments in the category will be wildly successful. So uh, as we saw in the uh, tech bubble, um, almost anything related to the internet had its price bid way up. Today, uh, you see something similar in the electric vehicle space where all the companies uh, uh, inter valuations are bid up to, to extreme levels, and not just the, the potential makers of electric vehicles, um, the service providers, uh, companies that make charging stations, companies that manufacture batteries, are also all going up as part of that. And at the end of the day, um, a lot of these companies are competing against each other, and, and not all of them can claim that total addressable market. Only a handful will ultimately be successful. So the investors that are in the um, other types of investments 
or other companies in that sector uh, that, that, that fail or don't succeed uh, will, will lose money. Another characteristic of an investment bubble is that uh, price becomes increasingly unmoored uh, from underlying fundamentals. So we, we basically have a story and the story drives price more than potential underlying fundamentals. Tesla, in my opinion, is a, is a good example of that. And I'll, I'll show you something on that in a minute. Um, and there are always Pied Pipers associated with the bubble. Um, so in the, in the go-go years, in the mid-late 60s, uh, Jerry Sy of the Manhattan Fund was a growth stock guy um, who was one of the faces of that uh, time. And then in the uh, internet bubble in the mid-late uh, 1990s, you had lots of people, but um, Mary Meeker, Henry Blodgett, George Gilder were uh, the first two were analysts. The last one was a kind of a market guru. Um, and there are many others who talked uh, about the potential of the internet and anything connected with it. Uh, today, Elon Musk, you know, if the, when the big book is written on this investment period, Elon Musk will almost certainly be the, if not the, one of the most um, influential of the Pied Pipers uh, uh, of this um, particular era. Um, and the other thing to know is that these investment bubbles, Tesla, electric vehicles, Bitcoin or, or cryptos, um, this is nothing new. Uh, in the past, um, there have been other bubbles with things like uh, tulips, stocks, bonds, real estate, uh, and the behaviors are remarkably similar over hundreds of years in these periods of extreme price appreciation. If you go back and read books that detail these eras, and there are lots of them, um, that it's striking how uh, you can take some of the quotes and pretty much they would be interchangeable to the different periods and even today. So what do some of these bubbles look like? Well, this is a, a chart from uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, Jim Reed at Deutsche Bank, which takes a look at some of them and uh, looks at price moves within three years of the peak of the bubble. Within, uh, so the biggest one, if you use that criteria, is the tulip mania in the early 1600s, where the price of tulips <laughs> escalated by 2,200% in three years. Um, then we have uh, the Mississippi Company in 1720, um, and uh, two over is the South Sea Bubble of 1720, um, where uh, Sir Isaac Newton, arguably the most intelligent human being that ever lived, um, lost a fortune uh, speculating in that market. And that, uh, so the Mississippi Company, which was uh, in France, um, was up 1,900% within three years. Uh, now you can see Bitcoin in third place, the Bitcoin uh, rally from 2019 through today. And this particular piece is not up to date. The Bitcoin rally would be higher uh, than is shown in this chart. So we have one category of investment, Bitcoin, um, where the increase over the last three years is in the same ballpark, is, 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 is the third largest uh, bubble, if you will, of uh, all time as uh, at this point. I don't think it would take over uh, the Mississippi Company in second place. And then you can see other, um, uh, the fifth one is the radio stocks in the 1920s. I'll talk a little bit about that. Gold in the uh, 19, late 70s and early 80s. Um, uh, Chinese equities, and then notice that the tech bubble is um, uh, not the biggest one. And then the fangs, third from the right, up 200% over the last three years. Um, it makes the cut, but it was far from the biggest bubble. So these are just the idea of the magnitudes in a three-year period um, that have happened in the past 
uh, in some of these. Now, some we don't have in here uh, the, the investment manias around the canals, the railroads, and some other things that probably would belong in here if we had the data for it. Now, if we tighten things up a little bit and say, instead of looking at appreciation within three years, just look at one year, um, then we can see what put in the context a little bit more of what's going on today. So here we have um, the Mississippi company, uh, the dark blue being the biggest bubble, but we can see Bitcoin in, within the one year appreciation, not three as in the previous slide, but the one year up until the peak, Bitcoin is right up there with uh, the Mississippi company and uh, as the biggest bubble. Um, and you can see the red line, the S&P 500 is, uh, is far from that. And the tech bubble back in 2000 doesn't rank with these, but Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin does. And so um, uh, we're truly in a, uh, have some bubble-like activity in um, some of the markets that we're experiencing today. So I mentioned, um, you know, that the sentiment, you, you know, you read quotes out there um, that uh, uh, exemplify the narratives going on in terms of uh, the valuation paradigm has changed. Uh, there's been a fundamental change in criteria for judging security values. We can't use the old methods. We've entered a new valuation zone. The zone's a function of the internet, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, some of the statements sound more like religion than um, uh, investment analysis. Faith is central to every process of innovation. The act of creation is a religious act. And the investor who never acts until the financials affirm his choice is doomed to mediocrity. And then the United States has entered a new investment area where the old guidelines no longer apply. Well, I'm kind of sandbagging you here because um, actually, these are all quotes from previous uh, bubble eras. So the first one is from uh, the tech bubble. The second one is from 1929 in the, um, the bubble right before the crash that preceded the Depression. Uh, the next one um, by Mary Meeker, uh, again, the tech bubble uh, from fall of 1997. And there, George Gilder. Uh, is writing today on Bitcoin. Mary Meeker is also an active analyst today, by the way. Uh, George Gilder today, his uh, new mission is Bitcoin. Um, and he wrote this uh, almost right at the before the collapse of the tech bubble. And then uh, Barron's in 1969 in the go-go years. And uh, uh, the last quote is from New U.S. News World Report in the go-go years. So in the go-go years, in the 1920s, in the go-go years of the late 60s, uh, and in the tech bubble, they were all driven by technological, technological change, radio and, and um, some other technological advances in the 20s. Um, in the go-go years, it was technology. In the tech bubble, it was technology. And today, it was technology. And so um, here's kind of what happened in the uh, tech bubble. Um, uh, in the uh, 1920s with um, uh, uh, RCA representing that era. And you can see we've plotted RCA um, w w using the S&P radio phonograph and musical instrument index. It was truly a big bubble. Uh, the NASDAQ in 2000 is the dark blue, right up almost as high. And then the... Um, the fangs uh, in the S&P 500 are on, uh, comparable to the 2000 peak. Um, and in uh, the RCA bubble, radios went from like two and a half million at the beginning of the uh, 1920s uh, to, uh, to, I think it was 25 million in the late 20s. And then after even through the depression, it went up to almost over uh, 35 million households with radios. And the stock of RCA went from three cents a share in the early 20s to 114. 
And then it crashed in the depression from 114 to $5 a share. So investors would have lost more than 95% of their investment, even while radio use continued on to double again in the next few years, almost double in the next few years. And that's typically what happens. I mean, RCA had the radio, the market for radios increased. They had competition. Um, there was a big market. Uh, uh, nobody factored, uh, considered the competition that RCA may have. So radio was wildly successful, expanded throughout the country. Um, and yet the, the first company uh, that had scale and, and uh, addressed the market uh, was uh, not a good investment for a lot of people. And so today we have some similar things going on. S clear speculative behavior. Probably you've read about a, a few weeks ago how Elon Musk had a tweet that had Signal in it. And as a result of that, a company called Signal Advance Inc., which was had nothing to do with Musk's tweet other than it had Signal in it, um, went up just because of this tweet, wrong tweet, um, over 400% in like a day. Subsequently, it moved back down to under $2 a share and crashed, but everybody who went in uh, lost money. Now, that's clearly speculative behavior, a speculative mindset. It has nothing to do with the company, the money it makes, its underlying fundamentals. It was a narrative uh, that people acted on in the short term. And then a lot of you have probably read about GameStop, which is an unprofitable old technology gaming company with stores and um, that's... Uh, uh, highly shorted. In other words, a lot of institutional investors are betting against the company's share. They, they're betting that the share prices go down. And so the uh, individual investors are banding together uh, in uh, Robin Hood um, and some other uh, venues where they can uh, collaborate and buy and sell and, and move the price. So they uh, um, basically hurt the institutional investors who were short and caused the price to escalate rapidly. Um, although the underlying fundamentals for the company uh, are still ghastly. Um, and this happened uh, once, it's just happened starting again recently. Some other names where this has happened are AMC. Uh, AMC is the big one, which just is it basically still in process of happening. And another, from the South Sea bubble, one of the funny things is one of the promoters said, uh, in an investment opportunity in, in around 1720, um, th they were trying to raise money and they wouldn't tell anybody what it was for. They said, uh, we are raising money for a company for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is. Well, I give you SPACs. Today, there are special purpose acquisition companies, they're called, uh, that have had a big run up. Uh, they are investment pools uh, offered as securities that gather up um, a lot of money. And when people do invest in them, they're basically uh, initial public offerings, uh, in some cases, uh, gathering billions of investor dollars out there. But nobody knows what they're going to do with the money. They're going to go out there uh, typically and buy a private company. And then by virtue of doing that, that private company will now be public because the the SPAC, which sells shares out in the market, will own it. So there's a couple things going on here. One is that it's a great way for a, pri a private company to bypass all the re legal requirements re uh, in doing an initial private offering of their own shares. They bypass uh, the SEC and a lot of the other. It's become, it's become very much more difficult to do an IPO because of regulatory um, issues over in, in the last 10 years since the great financial crisis. So this is a way that, to short circuit that. The second is the SPACs typically have preferential deal terms for the promoters, the people who set it up. Uh, if there's debt involved, the people providing the debt. Um, and in many cases, if you look in the media, there are celebrities involved in promoting these SPACs. Uh, they are... Um, I'm not going to name names because I'm, I'm I don't trust my memory enough. But if you go Google, I know Colin Kaepernick, the controversial NFL quarterback, is associated with a SPAC. Um, I think Tom Brady might be too. And so these celebrities are adding their names to this pool of money that doesn't own anything yet, beside but the investors' cash that will go out 
uh, and buy a company for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but we don't know what it is yet. I personally think this is hysterical that um, this uh, actually this uh, process from the 1720s is active today. And so uh, SPACs, these are in, in initial public offerings through September of last year. And in red, you see SPAC proceeds. Um, and, and this year, uh, SPACs last year raised more money than they did in their entire history. And this year, they're on process uh, to eclipse that. Um, it, and it's a um, very uh, active and relevant uh way of raising capital today, people uh, investing in blind pools where their investment terms most of the time are advantageous to someone else. Um, the other thing is, you know, I mentioned with RCA that uh, uh, the company that starts a narrative, the technology company may not do so well or even be the one who bring, brings it to fruition. So a quote from Warren Buffett basically saying, you know, investors in the airline industry would have been better off if overweight had been shot down at Kitty Hawk because they lost, most investors in the airlines have lost a lot of money uh, over the years. Um, and if you look back at the history of the canals and railroads, you see the same thing. Um, it, canals and railroads changed the country. Uh, they were instrumental in industrializing and modernizing the U.S., but so many investors came in with so much capital and only a handful of the initial rail companies survived. And uh, they're very capital intensive uh, businesses. And uh, so it, it turns out it's much more difficult in a lot of these cases uh, historically to make money in these powerful narratives that were actually disruptive and transformative to the economy. So an example here, I'm gonna look at Tesla, and this is data from the end of last year. Tesla's even up more this year. But if you look at uh, what Tesla's market cap was um, earlier this year, uh, so if you take the, all the stock out there from Tesla, multiply it by the price, it's worth more than 700 billion. Um, you could have bought the nine largest automakers in the world that are responsible for two thirds of the world auto production. So Tesla's worth about 1.4 million for every car it's expected to produce this year and $500,000 for every car it has ever produced. So clearly uh, the price people are paying from Tesla today, um, the expectations are that it's going to be as valuable, as powerful and productive is the top nine car companies today. Well, I don't think that that is um, a realistic expectation, especially since every company on that list has a slate of electronic vehicles coming out um, now or within the next 15 years to compete with Tesla. Um, and we do not know who is going to survive in the future. If you look at the tech bubble and you look at the top 10 companies in 2000 by market capitalization in terms of size, and then you look at how much they made in the 20 years subsequent to that. Um, so all these companies that were highly valued, uh, Microsoft, Cisco, and you look at the annualized return um, for the next uh, 20 years, um, you see single digit and in some cases even negative numbers. There are no large double digit returns. And we see this as another phenomenon we often see where companies that have done well in one period or in bubbles in subsequent time periods uh, tend not to do as well. And so uh, you, you can almost see that in every decade and bubbles may or may not be part of that process but they certainly um, uh, accentuate it. Now, the previous slide I showed was by market capitalization. Here's one of the market gurus, the Pied Pipers of the tech bubble that I mentioned earlier that had one of the quotes. 
And these were his nine top recommendations, uh, nine companies poised to change the world. And he wrote this in, in uh, December 31st in 1999, right before the tech bubble blew up. Um, and if you look at how they did subsequently, well, uh, global crossing, accounting fraud, bankrupt, Lucent Technologies lost 97.5% of the value of its stock uh, at, at the trough. J, uh, JDS Uniphase lost 90, almost 99% of its value. Uh, WorldCom uh, account went bankrupt. Nortel bankrupt. Um, Broadcom was acquired and troughed at nine, uh, loss of 95%. So it's really important to take a look at this and know that when you're looking at things like Tesla or Bitcoin or whatever, that have had these huge run-ups that um, uh, in, the, in the narratives you're hearing out there that have been talked about, that here's a past narrative. Um, and I can I could do this for the go-go years in the 60s. I could do this for the 20s, where these companies, uh, after the bubble burst, lost a tremendous amount of money when the music stopped and they pulled eight out of 10 chairs. Um, uh, you know, this, this is what can happen when a bubble bursts. Now today, what about today? Where are we today? Well, I've talked a little bit about Bitcoin and Tesla, things in particular, and SPACs that are clearly exhibiting bubble-like behavior in terms of their price ascent and their disconnect from fundamentals. But overall, here's something on the S&P 500 where we can see <clears throat> that overall, uh, in terms of a number of valuation metrics, um, in terms of market cap by GDP and multiples on profits or earnings, that we are in, you know, that at the top or in the top decile of historical valuation ranges. It's only when you um, take a look at free cash flow yield and then earnings yield versus the bond market that things don't look so bad. And this, I'm going to show a little bit more on this last one later. And what it's saying is, the U.S. market's very expensive, but when you look at it relative to what I can make on cash or the bond or different parts of the bond market, it actually doesn't look too bad because bond yields and cash yields are so low today. So like in the tech bubble, I had an alternative of I can make five, six percent on government, short term government securities. Today, I'm basically making close to zero. And so my alternative uh, investments uh, opportunities are very different from what they were in the tech bubble, which makes people think, um, well, even though these things are expensive, maybe, you know, they're not that expensive relative to everything else. In fact, maybe the bonds are in a bubble because the rates are at, you know, the lowest they've ever been in the, U in the history of the U.S. Uh, and that's certainly something to think about. But there are industries within the S&P that were hurt during COVID um, that haven't recovered yet. And so you see some of the old school industries, their energy, airlines, aerospace, banks, um, that are that as of the end of last year, were still down. Now they've recovered some this year, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, but they are not part of this uh, valuation. So there's still places to go within the US market that are not extremely expensive. And if we want to look at valuations where they are now relative to history, what we have here is a plot of valuation ratios um, by Robert Schiller's measure, the, what we call the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio or CAPE. And what it's simply trying to do is take earnings from the last 10 years, uh, put them in today's dollars by adjusting for inflation, averaging them, and then dividing by price. So it's this This is basically like, you know, the, the average price per square foot on real estate over the last 10 years. This is the average in the stock market. It's the average price I'm paying for a dollar of corporate earnings over the last 10 years. The reason we look at 10 years and not like the last 12 months is because it matters where you are in the business cycle. Uh, in the U.S., uh, not considering COVID for a minute, uh, because it's not a traditional business recession, but we've been in, we had been in an expansion, um, you know, for 12 years. Whereas in Europe and uh, some of the emerging economies, they really never haven't really had an expand much of an expansion at all since the Great Financial Crisis. So it matters where you value 
uh, where you do that calculation. But in any case, if you look, the purple line here is the US. And you can see here is the tech bubble where prices we're, they're paying in terms of this CAPE almost $45 for a dollar of corporate earnings. Today, we're about 36, so we're not as high as the tech bubble for the US stock market, but we're close. And you can see the big difference in return or in, in valuation uh, from the US versus Asia, Europe, and the emerging markets has been people over the last five, six years are willing to pay more for a dollar of corporate earnings in the US than abroad. Now, this is very expensive. Some people would say it's not in a bubble, but here's some other bubbles. Here's the uh, Japan bubble. Now, this is the a an Asia stock index where they're in Asia paying $80 for a dollar of corporate earnings in the late 80s. And if you were alive during the Japan bubble, you would know what I'm talking about. That basically a time when uh, the Jap Japanese automakers were taking over the market. Japanese management techniques were superior. Just-in-time inventory was the rage. And um, at one point, the land in the uh, emperor's palace uh, grounds in Tokyo was worth more than the entire state of California. And if you look at the Japanese market, uh, the multiple on it was $100 for a dollar of Japanese corporate earnings, far in excess of our tech bubble. <coughs> and post this Japan bubble, Right now, the uh, Japanese stock market is still only worth um, maybe about 60% of what it was back then. Uh, and this is uh, uh, 30 years later. Um, and that's what can happen if you're, if you're in a bubble. It can take a long, capital can take a long time to recover. So you want to be cognizant of, of uh, how present uh, how much investment you have when markets are becoming overvalued because most of the time markets recover within a few years. But in when these big bubbles hit, uh, it can take a long, long time. I think uh, in the U.S. Tech, tech bubble, it took over 20 years for the NASDAQ to get back to the prices it was during 99. Uh, uh, so today, if we look at uh, this compilation by Bridgewater Associates, they looked at six measures of, of, uh, of uh, characteristics of a bubble. Are prices high relative to traditional measures? Uh, are, they, are prices unmoored from fundamentals? Are they discounting unsustainable conditions in the future? Have new buyers enter the market? They're broad bullish sentiment and so on. And you can see in the 20s, um, the 20s bubble ticked off almost every box, all, all six here, either uh, bubble characteristics or frothy, as did the dot-com bubble. In 2007, before the great financial crisis, however, it really wasn't a stock market bubble. It was a uh, liquidity cr solvency crisis um, uh, triggered by too much debt and uh, lax due diligence in some of the debt and real estate sectors. But the stock markets, uh, uh, no bubble in terms of uh, valuations or pricing. It was a little frothy in terms of sentiment. Um, there was lots of leverage. Um, but in overall, even though it was such a big stock market decline, the stock market was not the, in, a, in, the, in the state of a bubble. It's, it's active, its prices were affected by what else was going on in the economy. So if we look at today um, and you look at the emerging tech sector, so this would be things like Tesla and the, the electronic vehicle um, sector with batteries and charging and, and some of the other um, uh, biotech firms. We, we, we are close to bubble-like conditions. If you remove those from the overall stock market and say, well, what about you know, the rest of the stock market? Is the whole stock market bubbly or frothy? And uh, Bridgewater's answers on this, which we concur with, are, no, not really. Um, they're maybe a little frothy, but uh, not all sectors of the stock market are in bubble-like conditions. But over here, you would probably add cryptocurrencies to uh, the column on the right. Um, I earlier made the comment on uh, 
you know, that the other opportunities in the investment space are not the same as they were in past bubbles. And so today, even though some stock markets like the U.S. are expensive, uh, they are not expensive abroad, um, far from it. And, and also, the dividend yields I can earn, which I have listed countries here and the dividend yields are in the gold, are often greatly in excess of the, what I can make on that country's 10-year bonds. And that wasn't the case in the tech bubble or anywhere else. So just the, the income alone from my stocks, not even considering future earn, reasonable assumptions for future earnings growth, um, stocks are a, a much better uh, alternative than bonds were 20 years ago. And even in the U.S., while the dividend yields at this point now are slightly yet less than the 10-year bond yield, um, or actually at this moment in time, as of yesterday, they're higher now again. Uh, the ten-year yield has gone back down, but um, you know, not since the '50s have we had an environment where dividend yields in the stock market were higher than bond market yields for an extended period. And so, returns on b bonds and cash are very low today, which makes the stock market, even though it's expensive, probably not overall in a bubble. Um, uh, it makes the stocks look good, and stocks from outside the U.S. are even better. So those are some of the things I wanted to say today. I, to do this subject justice, I could have had hours. Uh, there's a lot to talk about and show, but I did present the characteristics of bubbles, what some information on what drives them, and some historical perspective, and, and some of the things we think are a little bubblicious today and uh, uh, some of the things you can think about to do um, to try to uh, uh, not get caught up when the chairs are pulled in musical chairs. So thank you so much for your time today and look forward to seeing you again for our next presentation.